Psalm 96, 6 says, strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Welcome to Through the Bible. Today, Dr. J. Vernon McGee tells us more about how strength and beauty were illustrated in the furnishings of the temple built by Solomon. As we go through the whole Word of God in five years, we'll hear Dr. McGee make many more connections like this between books in the Bible, some in rather unusual places. So don't miss a study. And while you take a minute to find your seat, Greg and I want to share a couple of quick letters from our fellow Bible bus passengers in South Africa. That's right, Steve. And actually, more specifically, we have multiple languages like Afrikaans and African English. But we want to talk today about the language of Zulu, which is the most widely spoken language in the country of South Africa. Yes, it is the trade language. That's right. Zulu is. That's right. You're you're knowledgeable. I'm channeling that, my, that's my your, Peterman from Seinfeld. Yes, very good. Very yes. good. This 24% of South Africans speak Zulu. So we have some great letters uh, in response to a ministry, by the way, that's been on the air since 1995. Yeah, we've had a longstanding commitment to Zulu in South Africa. Yeah. Here's the first one. This is from Bartholomew. He says, a friend told me about your program and I listen daily. I must say we are in crises in the house of the Lord to find true teaching of the word of God. You make me thank the Lord that at least we have people who are still preaching it pure without adding their own things. I just want to ask you, please keep ministers in your prayers. Prayer for God's favor in their lives to preach only the true gospel of God. We are also praying for you that God will help keep on using you for his glory. And that's so many pastors uh, rely on the teaching of through the Bible, and that's what he's referring to. Now, here's another one. I am from the Eastern Cape, writes Zamil. I am a long-distance truck driver. I just want to share with you that although our jobs keep us on the road long hours, the powerful sermons that you broadcast through the radio keep us awake and remind us that it is the grace of God that we are safe on the road. Hmm. I travel with two guys. When I first started listening, my companions complained, but now they remind me <laughs> to tune in at the time of the program. Thank you for encouraging me and strengthening my faith. I don't have the opportunity to go to church, but through your program, my soul is always full of the Word of God. Wow, that is so encouraging. Here's another one. This is, Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus, writes Sindiswa. I am writing to you to let you know how much your programs have changed my life. I am a new believer, and I thank God for your Bible teaching. It is in this Bible study where I get all the answers about things I don't understand. I will keep listening and taking it to heart. And by the way, my name means saved, and now I am. <laughs> Beautiful. You know, the, the stories we get from around the world are like fingerprints, aren't they? They're just, yeah. each has an individual characteristic to yeah. it. Yeah, it's such an encouragement to hear how the Lord is moving and blessing his word throughout the world. Greg, why don't you pray for our listeners worldwide and also for our study as we launch into First Kings. Father, we're so grateful that you've given us the chance to speak your word and teach it and present it to people truly on a worldwide basis. That's only your grace. We pray you would continue to reach people with your word around the world. And now here on this program, as many, many people listen, will hearts be changed and lives transformed. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, now leads us through the Bible. Now our study today, friends, brings us to the seventh chapter of First Kings, and we saw last time the building of the temple. It was seven years in building, we are told, and we saw that it was much inferior actually to the tabernacle, though it was rich and ornate and probably cost five million dollars. It was a little jewel box not large. It was only twice as large as the tabernacle, but around it were buildings, and there were many complications, many intricacies that were not in the tabernacle. And the tabernacle in the New Testament becomes the model that speaks of Christ. Actually, the temple, although we'll see that the Shekinah glory came upon it, It never really measured up to what the tabernacle was, and there never really was the power there that there was in the tabernacle. We feel today if we get the right method, we've got it made, but it's not in methods. It's rather today in the power of the Spirit of God as he takes the Word of God and uses it. Today we are absolutely obsessed 
and we're submerged, overwhelmed by methods. And a great many people feel like if they can just get the right book and get the right method and make the right approach, that's all that we need. My friend, we need the Word of God today, and it's the only solution to the problem. And someone says, well, the Bible is not popular today. Friends, we're finding that a great many people are still interested in the Word of God. And it's certainly brand new to a great many folk because there's not much teaching of the Bible in our day. Now, in chapter 7 here, we see that Solomon not only built the temple, but he built some other structures here. Notice verse 1. But Solomon was building his own house 13 years, and he finished all his house. Now, the temple was seven years, and his palace was almost twice as long in building. It must have been a very elaborate sort of thing. And then we're told in verse 2, he built also the house of the forest of Lebanon. That was his lodge, you know, his second house, where he went on vacation. And we're told that the length thereof was a hundred cubits. That's longer than a football field, by the way. And the breadth thereof, 50 cubits. That's 75 feet. Height thereof, 30 cubits. That's 60 feet. Upon four rows of cedar pillars with cedar beams upon the pillars. Now, all this material was furnished by Hiram, king of Tyre, by the way. Hiram furnished the stone, and he also furnished the cedars, the cedars of Lebanon. Very few of those graceful, tall cedars are left today. All of that country has been, including Palestine, has been denuded. At one time, it was apparently heavily timbered, but not so today. Now we find that he not only built that, but he built other things. And I'll drop down to verse 8. And his house where he dwelt had another court within the porch which was of the like work. In other words, he built in a very ornate and elaborate way. Now we're told Solomon made also a house for Pharaoh's daughter whom he had taken to wife, like unto this porch. He seems to have put her in a very favored position. And he couldn't build all of those girls a palace. If he did, he'd have had a thousand of them. And that would have been a building program that would look like a housing development today, uh, a government project. But he didn't do that. Now, we are told that that's not all that he did. But we find here that a great deal of detail is given about how the stones were hewn out. They were costly stones, and he made a great court in that day. And we are told in verse 13, And King Solomon sent and fetched Hiram out of Tyre, and this man was a worker in brass. Now, Hiram here is not the king, apparently a man named for the king, and a very skilled workman of that day. And he's the one that made all of these delicate pieces of statuary and that which was made out of iron and brass and gold, all of that. This was highly ornamented, the work that Solomon is doing. It is the evidence of an affluent period and a time of peace. It's in time of peace that the arts develop, of course and a time when there is an affluent society, and a time of prosperity and peace, and that's what this period was. Now we're told that not only did he do that, but also we have some more detail relative to the temple, the things that he did there. We're told in verse 21, and he set up the pillars in the porch of the temple, and he set up the right pillar and called the name thereof Jachin. And he set up the left pillar and called the name thereof Boaz. Jachin and Boaz. Now, these two, you'll find that there are psalms that include this. Boaz means, in it is strength. And Jachin means, God shall establish. And what you have here is strength and beauty. And that's exactly what Psalm 96, 6 says, strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Now, strength speaks of salvation. 
It speaks of God able to deliver those that are his. And beauty speaks of the beauty of worship, and we're to worship him in the beauty of holiness. So that you have here these two pillars. And these are two pillars, by the way, that should be spiritually in the life of anyone that's going to worship God. If you are going to worship God, you must know something of his salvation. You must have experienced the power of God in delivering you from sin. And then you must also come and worship him in the beauty of holiness. Now, that doesn't mean that there should be lights and colors and that type of thing. And I do not mean to be just a perfect square. I see nothing wrong in having a beautiful sanctuary and have nice appointments. I think that it's quite proper. But those things are conducive to worship, but they're not worship, and they're no substitute for worship today. We worship him in the beauty of holiness. When you and I come into the presence of God, sense his presence, realize our inadequacy and how we come short, and then we can see him in all of his beauty and in his glory. It was the experience of Isaiah when he went into the temple, you remember, and he was given a vision of God. He's high and holy and lifted up, and this man, Isaiah, sees himself in the light of the presence of God, and he goes down on his face before God. That is the meaning of these two pillars that are there. They speak of what really is worship today, a redeemed soul who comes into the presence of a holy God. You don't rush in. And I must again say this, and I recognize that there's a difference of opinion here, and it'd be very easy for somebody to say that you're no authority in the realm of music. My friends, I tell you, the music today that doesn't lift you into the presence of God, that's not music. There's a great deal of music in the church today that turns you off, and there's no preparation at all. I have discovered in my ministry and in my conference work that oftentimes a number by the choir or a solo or some musical number before the message is given is absolutely devastating and destructive to the giving out of the Word of God. We need to recognize that worship must be made on the basis that he is high and holy and lifted up. That is the thing that we need to recognize in everything. Now, we have here some other things that I need to call attention to in the temple. Verse 23, he made a molten sea, ten cubits from the one brim to the other. It was round all about. You see, now instead of having the laver with the water in it, there is a molten sea. It was a thing of beauty, but you couldn't get clean by it. There's a great deal of services in the church today. It's beautiful, but it doesn't cleanse you and bring you into the presence of God. It doesn't refresh your soul. It doesn't bring peace and joy to the heart. These are the things that are important here. Now, there's something else that we need to note, and I drop down to verse 38. Then made he ten lavers of brass. Believe me, one laver contained 40 baths. Now, here is an excess on the other side. All these lavers here. Well, may I say, all that cleanses today is the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, just keeps on cleansing us from all sin. How important that is, and that's all important. I want to continue to drop right down here. We have some other articles of furniture for the temple. Verse 48, And Solomon made all the vessels that pertained unto the house of the Lord. The altar of gold and the table of gold were upon the showbread was, and the candlesticks of pure gold, five on the right side and five on the left. Now, uh, instead of one lampstand that spoke of Christ, five on each side, ten of them that are there. One is enough to speak of him, you see. Today, there is a grave danger in overemphasizing this matter of Jesus, Jesus. 
Now, I hope you won't think I'm critical, because if you do think I'm critical, you are right. I am. But I listened to a message that was given on radio that party mentioned the name of Jesus. When it was halfway through the message, over 50 times that he mentioned the name of Jesus. May I say to you, just keep mentioning his name. Just keep multiplying golden lampstands. That's not the thing. May I say to you, all we need to recognize today that you don't become familiar with him at all. I am hearing so much of this over-familiarity with Jesus. I heard a man say the other day that he was going to come into the presence of Jesus and sit down and talk with him. Well, now, maybe he will. I don't know. But the scene that I have given to me of the glorified Christ and of a man who was very familiar with him when he was here on earth, he'd rebuke him and make suggestions to him. It was John. John wanted to bring down fire from heaven, suggested the Lord destroy this. He was always making suggestions to the Lord. Didn't pay attention to him, however, but he'd make them. And he reclined on his bosom in the upper room. He was very familiar with him in the days of his flesh. But John says, when I saw him on the Isle of Patmos, the glorified Christ, I fell at his feet as dead. I think that's where you're going to be. This idea today, just because we keep multiplying lampstands, and we become overly familiar with him, and just keep pronouncing his name, friends. Let's not get familiar with him, how wonderful he is. And he's one we worship, we adore him today. And he is the one that we fall down before. That's important to see. Now we have other things that are said here. We have in verse 51, So was ended all the work that King Solomon made for the house of the Lord. And Solomon brought in the things which David his father had dedicated even the silver and the gold and the vessels did he put among the treasures of the house of the Lord. See, David is the one that had gathered all of these things. And so the articles of furniture that David had protected are now brought in. Now in chapter 8, we have the dedication and we see the glory of the Lord filling the temple after the ark was brought from the tabernacle and installed inside the Holy of Holies. Now, let me begin reading at verse 1 of chapter 8 of 1 Kings. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel, all the heads of the tribes, the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel, unto King Solomon in Jerusalem. Now we have here the dedication. Will you note here verse 5 in King Solomon, all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be told nor numbered from multitude. Now you must recall that the number of animals that were offered here, the explanation of how it can be done is easy. They had two altars to begin with. And then for this occasion, they had many temporary altars that were there. And they thought by the continual sacrifice but that, my friend, wasn't the impressive thing. He has appeared once in the end of the age to offer himself once for the sins of the world. Didn't need all of this, but Solomon went in for that type of thing. Now we are told that when the ark was brought in, that the glory filled the house. Verse 10, it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord. In other words, they brought in the ark and they took the staves out of it because it's not to be moved anymore. And the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Now we have this dedication. Verse 12, then spoke Solomon. The Lord said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. I have surely built thee a house to dwell in, a settled place for thee to abide in forever. But now notice, somebody says, well, he did expect God to dwell in it. No, he didn't. Let's keep reading down. Verse 17, it was in the heart of David, my father, to build a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. And the Lord said unto David, my father, whereas it was in thine heart to build a house unto my name, 
thou didst well that it was in thine heart. That is, God says, I'll give David credit for it. I think we ought to call it David's temple. It's not Solomon's temple. The only temple he had is on the side of his head. This is not his temple. It was David's temple. It was David's idea. Now, verse 20, And the Lord hath performed his word that he spoke, and I am risen up in the room of David my father, set on the throne of Israel, as the Lord promised, and have built a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. Now, notice this tremendous dedication prayer here of Solomon. I'm not going to read all of it. I want to drop down just to lift out verse 27. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I builded. Well, Solomon didn't understand God was going to dwell in that house. That's pagan friends to think God can dwell in a house. And we today have the pagan notion of calling the church God's house, not God's house. I tell you, God today indwells believers, not houses. And when believers are meeting in a church, God is there in the person of the Holy Spirit. But when they all go out and the lights are turned out, God's no more in that building than he's in any bar room in the place. Why, my friends, he doesn't dwell in a house. Now notice verse 29, that thine eyes may be opened toward this house night and day, even toward the place of which thou hast said, my name shall be there. This is the place that you approach him. And this is the way we approach him today. What you shall ask in my name. My name shall be there, that thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make toward this place. Now, they were told that if they prayed toward that place, God would hear and God would answer their prayer. This is a very wonderful thing. Certainly, the prayer of Solomon reveals that no primitive notion of God. The temple now becomes the center of worship. And the world was to come to the temple to worship. Israel in captivity was to turn toward the temple and pray. God says that if you turn toward this and that he would hear and forgive. That's verse 30. Now let me drop down here to verse 41. Moreover, concerning a stranger that's not of thy people Israel, but cometh out of a far country for thy name's sake, and they shall hear of thy great name and of thy strong hand and of thy stretched out arm. Then he shall come and pray toward this house. Hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and do according to all that the stranger calleth to thee for, that all people of the earth may know thy name to fear thee as do thy people Israel, and that they may know that this house which I have built it is called by thy name. Now, this is the place of worship. And Israel's witness to the world is different than ours. We are told to go to all the world. God does not meet man in any particular place. He'll meet him in any place today. But in that day, it was come, let us go to the house of the Lord. And the stranger would come from afar, as the queen of Sheba, we shall see. She came, and this coming, my friend, reveals the fact that the way God was approached was by coming to Jerusalem. This was the way to God. All of that speaks of Christ and the cross of Christ, and that's the way to God today. He made it very clear, no man cometh to the Father but by me. It's not through a temple today. It's not through a ritual. It's not through a service, but it's through Jesus Christ today that we come to God. Now, there's something else here we don't have time to go in today. We'll pick it up next time. God here prophetically tells them they'll go into captivity. When they do, they're to pray toward this place. And we're going to find out that this became very meaningful in the life of a man by the name of Daniel. Got him in trouble, but it also got him out of trouble. And we'll have to reserve that till next time, and we'll just continue to pursue this study in 1 Kings Trust that if you're not joining with us and going through the Bible, you will. It'll be a thrilling experience for you, probably an experience that cannot be duplicated in this world. And this may be for you once in a lifetime. Until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved.
There are more great adventures to come in God's Word. Until then, if you need to contact us, please call 1-800-65-BIBLE or visit ttb.org. grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners, whom God uses to take the whole word to the whole world.